Good evening, everybody. I'm Jessica Nickel, the director and chief curator of the Smith College Museum of Art, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the opening lecture of the Emily Hall Tremaine Symposium. And just an organizational note, I look forward to, I hope, seeing many of you here tomorrow, and I want to emphasize here, the early promotional literature for this symposium suggested it was happening in the Campus Center, but because we have so many people expected, we'll be meeting here at 9 o'clock tomorrow morning. Fifteen years ago, Smith alumna Dorothy Tremaine Hilt, class of 1949, generously directed a grant to Smith from the Emily Hall Tremaine Foundation to convene symposia that would shed light on the kinds of careers students with training in studio art and the history of art might wish to follow and to bring them together with alumni with experience in the field. At our last symposium, Real Lives of Women Artists, we brought together students and alumni for a candid discussion about earning a living as an artist. The tremendous response we received confirmed the college's strategic direction to strengthen the bridges between a student's academic and work life. This year, we're exploring an equally essential role, that of the art collector, with the aptly titled program, Collecting Drawings, a Public and Private Affair. Indeed, the genesis of the program is the private passion of a Smith alumna who has generously lent a portion of her collection to be shown at the Smith College Museum of Art in Drawn to Excellence, Renaissance to Romantic Drawings. I hope you'll visit this extraordinary exhibition this weekend, and for those of you who live in the community, please visit us often this fall. The show will be on view till January 6th. It's the interrelationship and dependence between the private collector and public museum that we seek to explore over the course of our program. It is our hope that we may all leave with greater insight and understanding of the synergy between collector, dealer, curator, connoisseur, art historian, auctioneer, and ultimately, museum visitor. We think it appropriate to begin the program by focusing on the object of our collective affection, that is to say, a work of art. And we, think of no, we can think of no better guide than Nicholas Turner to direct us through a study of the work of Federico Barocci as illuminated by a drawing in the exhibition, Madonna Reading with the Christ Child on her lap. It is difficult to summarize the contribution Nicholas Turner has made to the scholarship of master drawings over the course of his 40-year career as a curator and art historian. 20 of those years were spent at the British Museum where he's, he was deputy keeper in the Department of Prints and Drawings from 1974 to 1994. He went on to work as curator of drawings at the J. Paul Getty Museum in Los Angeles and is now an independent art historian. His most recent exhibitions include European master drawings from Portuguese collections organized by the Belém Cultural Center in Lisbon, Italian drawings of the 16th century at the Prado in Madrid, and Guercino, the school and the manor, drawings from the Uffizi. His numerous publications include Leonardo, Michelangelo, and the Century of Genius, Master Drawings from the British Museum, Drawings by Guercino, Florentine Drawings of the 16th Century, From Michelangelo to Anibali Caracci, A Century of Italian Drawings from the Prado, and the subject of tonight's lecture, Federico, Federico Barocci. It's my great pleasure to present Nicholas Turner. Well, I would like to thank the director of the Smith College Museum of Art, Jessica Nichol, and the curator of prints and drawings, April Gallant, for inviting me to speak to you tonight. The subject of this talk is this beautiful double-sided drawing by Barocci on grey-blue paper, which is now on show in the stimulating exhibition of drawings from a private collection, which is here at the Smith Museum of Art. As those of you who have seen this lovely drawing, they will know that it's not quite as light as this. Um, the high-resolution image of it that I was sent uh, by April has allowed me in this lecture to use many um, good details of the drawing, but I'm afraid when seen overall, it doesn't look quite as pasty as this. The sheet is datable about 1567. On the recto is the Madonna reading with the Christ child on her lap, while on the verso, seen here turned 90 degrees and reduced in scale, is the torso of a bearded man. Both sides are drawn in black and white chalk with colored chalks or pastels, and the sheet measures 426 by 320 millimeters, approximately 17 by 13 inches. In other words, 
large by the standards of most old master drawings. In Rhoda Eitel Porter's excellent entry on the drawing in the catalogue to the exhibition Private Treasures, shown five years ago at the Morgan Library and the National Gallery of Art, Washington, she pointed out the connection of the recto with only minor differences to Barocci's painting of nearly identical size in the Palazzo Pallavicini in Rome. The works are exactly the same width, 32 centimeters, but there is a difference of 1.3 centimeters in height, the painting being slightly shorter. Without the possibility of seeing the picture out of its frame, we do not know whether it was the artist who adjusted the amount of space above the Madonna's head, or whether the painting was cut down at some later point. From the deckled edges of the paper of the drawing, it is clear that it has suffered little or no trimming over the course of its nearly 450 years of existence. Of the relationship with the Pallavicini painting, Rhoda concluded that, and I quote, the present drawing may have served as the artist's late finished study for the painted composition, or as a recorder, in other words, a copy, to be kept in the studio in order to replicate the composition as the need arose, or possibly in preparation for an engraving, close quotes. By reconsidering the recto drawing in the context of both the Pallavicini picture and other related paintings and drawings, I hope this evening to show that the drawing is far more significant, a far more significant work within the artist's surviving oeuvre than has previously been recognised. Indeed, it is my contention that it is certainly not a ricordo, but may well turn out to be Barocci's earliest known surviving cartone piccolo per i colori, or small-sized cartoon for colours. It is actual size, and on paper rather than in oil on canvas, as these cartoni piccoli per i colori were to become. It is therefore a fascinating forerunner of what would develop into standardised oil sketches for the colour in his compositions. Of all the 16th century Italian artists, Barocci was among the most fastidious in preparing his painted works with sequences of preparatory drawings, many of which survive. They can be divided into categories according to type, and a high proportion of them are connectable with his paintings. Not only are they interrelated by purpose and technique, but also by proportion, so that when necessary, figures could be traced from or enlarged from one sheet to another or to another surface. The easy breadth of Barocci's figure studies in coloured chalk, which anticipate effects in the medium by some 19th century French painters and others, has tended to conceal this more mechanical, craftsmanlike aspect of his work. During his mature period, Barocci followed a strictly regimented preparatory procedure for the compositions of his larger canvases. Alongside numerous compositional sketches and individual figure studies, this included the preparation of a number of different types of cartoon. Among these were actual sized cartoons from which the outlines and shadows of the composition could be transferred directly to the prepared surface of the canvas, and cartoons reduced in size in order to study the chiaroscuro and the colors. 
Bellori describes how Barocci made the latter type, the so-called cartone piccolo per i colori. For the colors, this is a quote, for the colors, he, Barocci, made another smaller cartoon from the big one just mentioned, in which they, the colors, were distributed according to their relative strengths. And he searched for a balance between one color and another, so that all colors together might have unity and concord without one clashing with another. And he would say that just as a melody comprising different human voices delights the ear, even more is sight pleasurably rewarded by a concord of colors accompanied by harmonious outlines. <laughs> 